Alors, euh, le Webicani Mobile, c'est une initiative qui a démarré en 2004 avec euh, la cinéaste Manon Barbeau, le Conseil de la Nation Atikamekw et le Conseil des jeunes de l'Assemblée de Première Nation du Québec du Labrador. C'est une initiative qui, euh, qui est inspirée d'une jeune femme Atikamekw qui euh, se battait pour euh, s'assurer que les jeunes de sa communauté luttent contre... Euh, les pensées noires et le suicide, qui étaient très alarmants dans sa communauté. Son nom, c'était Wapikoni. Donc, une jeune de 16-17 ans à l'époque, qui malheureusement est décédée sur la route mortelle de sa communauté, avec euh, les déforestations euh, immenses dans sa région. Donc, un peu inspirée de, de sa force et de sa persévérance et de sa joie de vivre, est né le projet Wapikoni Mobile. Alors, il s'agit de studios ambulants euh, qui partent équipés, complètement équipés euh, de matériel euh, audio visuel et cinématographique et de son très, très haut de gamme qui partent à la rencontre des jeunes dans les communautés de Première Nation afin de les accompagner à réaliser un court-métrage ou enregistrer euh, une musique ou un vidéoclip. Euh, puis à travers cette démarche, ces jeunes découvrent un peu... Euh, la structure de leurs pensées, leurs points de vue, leurs opinions, euh, découvre des habiletés pratiques comme le travail d'équipe, euh, la compétence de caméra et le matériel audiovisuel très, très euh, concret. Mais c'est davantage, je pense, toute la réflexion, euh, l'empowerment, la réflexion sur, finalement, prendre part à un débat de société, prendre part à une réflexion critique sur ce qui nous arrive, ce qui nous entoure, et l'exprimer de façon artistique et culturelle qui parle euh, au grand nombre, finalement. C'est ça. Donc, nous avons aujourd'hui 1000 films, euh, 750 vidéoclips, partenaires de l'UNESCO, reconnaissant que c'est une bibliothèque incroyable d'expression de, contemporaine de la culture autochtone et d'expression de la jeunesse face à la réalité de nos sociétés. Alors, euh, c'est vraiment une, une banque extraordinaire euh, de, de création. Mais le Wapikani, c'est aussi un lieu où on s'assure que ces, que ces films-là voyagent. Donc, c'est un outil d'éducation, de sensibilisation, de dialogue, de rapprochement entre les peuples, de promotion du vivre ensemble. On utilise finalement l'ensemble de ces films ou de ces vidéoclips pour créer des moments d'échange, euh, créer des moments de partage, puis finalement donc tenter de reconstruire nos relations euh, et euh, de co-construire un avenir ensemble. Donc, euh, c'est... Et quand on se permet de pouvoir, quand on a la possibilité de pouvoir faire voyager juste l'année passée, en 2017, on, les films ont voyagé dans plus de 250 festivals et événements tout le long de l'année. On essaye aussi, dans la mesure du possible, de faire voyager leurs réalisateurs avec les films. Donc, ça permet aux jeunes qui ont créé des œuvres qui sont remarqués dans des festivals pour la beauté et la qualité de leurs films, euh, de aussi avoir l'expérience de voyager avec leurs films et d'aller expliquer leur parcours. Euh, donc, encore une fois, ça développe toute leur capacité à prendre parole dans des, dans des lieux qu'ils qu n'ont peut-être pas l'habitude. Et puis, euh, ça leur permet de structurer davantage leurs pensées puis de réaliser l'impact que leur création artistique peut avoir dans différents milieux. Puis ça, bien, évidemment, ça les encourage à poursuivre. À poursuivre que ce soit dans le cinéma ou à poursuivre que ce soit dans... Peu importe ce qui les intéresse et ce qui les drive, finalement, ça les inspire à continuer à contribuer, continuer à créer un impact, continuer à faire partie euh, de la société dont ils rêvent. Moi, je pense vraiment que si on veut que notre avenir soit... soit que la vision qu'on a de notre avenir soit possible, il faut absolument intégrer la vision des jeunes, leurs rêves, leur vision, parce que c'est eux qui vont le porter euh, dans les générations futures. Par exemple, euh, euh, une jeune qui, a, après avoir fait quelques films avec nous, a été la première diplômée de l'Institut national de l'image et du son. Euh, on a une, une jeune Atikamekw qui actuellement est en stage à l'ONF, à l'Office national du film. Euh, on a des gens qui ont voyagé partout dans le monde euh, avec leurs films pour euh, présenter leurs films et qui maintenant sont, sont impliqués dans d'autres types de films, soit avec euh, le réseau international de créateurs audiovisuels autochtones que 
que le Voix Piconné a créé aussi euh, en 2015-2014, je crois. Donc, il y a tout un réseau international maintenant. Donc, il y a des jeunes qui s'en vont à l'international pour co-créer avec d'autres réalisateurs. Euh, dans le cadre de programmes de recherche universitaire, on a un jeune qui euh, étudie maintenant en sciences politiques et utilise la création de ses films et... Ces sujets de films sont très, très inspirés, finalement, de, de toute sa réflexion politique et critique hein, sur euh, nos sociétés, qu'elles soient autochtones ou non, mais sous un regard plus politique, par exemple. On a des jeunes qui euh, vivent dans des communautés très, très isolées, avec lesquels j'ai eu l'occasion d'aller au Forum permanent des Nations unies sur les questions autochtones. Cinq jeunes cinéastes très allumés qui se sont impliqués dans tous les groupes euh, en parallèle au Forum, euh, aux, aux Nations unies. Et, des groupes mondiaux pour la défense du caribou, pour la défense de, des rivières, euh, des manifestations euh, anti-Trump euh, auxquelles elles ont participé. Ou... Elles ont pris part à, finalement, euh, la société mondiale qui se mobilisait autour des enjeux et des questions autochtones. Donc, c'est quelques-uns des exemples magnifiques que le WAPI peut, peut avoir, mais autant des jeunes réalisateurs, autant des jeunes réalisateurs qui maintenant travaillent dans notre volet corporatif, qu'on appelle, c'est comme un volet de professionnalisation. Euh, finalement, on en a qui, après 14 ans, ont vraiment du talent marqué pour, pour différents éléments de la production. Et puis donc, on les implique dans des contrats avec des vrais clients, hein, où on, on fait un produit particulier. Par exemple... Euh, dans les dernières semaines, on est en négociation avec le G7 pour euh, produire, euh, dans le cadre de, du gros événement du G7, euh, une production vidéo pour la nation, quelques communautés de la nation Innu, afin de d'enregistrer de un peu la perspective de quelques jeunes euh, sur la réalité des enjeux environnementaux euh, en les amenant en territoire traditionnel. Donc, c'est vraiment génial. Encore au G7, on a l'occasion de diffuser 12 de nos films euh, donc pour permettre aux gens d'avoir la perspective de la jeunesse autochtone à l'égard des sujets de débat de société actuelle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On travaille avec des jeunes et des moins jeunes aussi. Peut-être que c'est important de le dire. Okay. Souvent, euh, on pense que l'éducation, c'est euh, vraiment juste la jeunesse ou en finalement euh, apprendre en créant, que nous, on aime dire au Wapikoni. Finalement, c'est en créant qu'on apprend euh, différents éléments. Euh, mais je pense que ça ne s'applique pas juste à la jeunesse. Je pense que euh, plusieurs études ont démontré que que les Autochtones ont, ont une façon d'apprendre qui, qui est beaucoup plus manuelle, beaucoup plus... Euh, euh, Finalement, la parole, l'exemple. Euh, donc, on travaille beaucoup dans le dialogue intergénérationnel parce qu'il y a énormément de, de transferts de connaissances qui se fait naturellement de cette façon-là. Et, et je sais qu'il y a plein d'études qui ont été faites sur comment les gens retiennent ou pas une certaine information. Dans le cadre de l'éducation, on cherche à avoir la meilleure rétention, finalement, d'informations. Puis je le sais que... que pour les, pour les Premières Nations, ben, beaucoup d'études ont démontré qu'on est davantage des auditifs. Hein? On vient de la tradition orale. Euh, on a besoin d'être en contact avec les éléments pour bien les comprendre. Euh, je pense que c'est comme ça que génétiquement, probablement, on a été construit de par nos ancêtres hein, qui nous ont toujours tout appris à, dans la nature en observant comment les éléments naturels euh, fonctionnaient euh, avec euh, les paroles de nos grands-parents qui nous enseignaient beaucoup de choses. Donc, je pense que c'est très important aussi dans le cadre du Wapikoni qu'on favorise ces espaces euh, intergénérationnels, ces, ces dialogues. Puis aussi, euh, entre la diversité des nations. Je pense que c'est important aussi. Il y a beaucoup, beaucoup d'apprentissage à faire entre les nations. Donc, cette ouverture à la diversité, euh, j'étais récemment dans un sommet des Amériques sur la culture. Puis, euh, on parlait de démocratisation culturelle ou de... Euh, citoyenneté culturelle euh, et, et comment s'assurer d'une participation la plus représentative, finalement. Euh, et puis, je trouvais que c'était important de dire que les, les, euh, les peuples autochtones au Canada doivent non pas juste participer à, à, à la création culturelle euh, du pays, mais elles doivent vraiment contribuer de façon pleine et entière à l'ensemble des facettes. Euh, je trouve souvent qu'on a tendance à ghettoiser des espaces hein, pour s'assurer une participation des Autochtones au lieu de les intégrer dans l'ensemble des espaces pour qu'elles contribuent, que, que, que leur création, que leur voix, que leurs expressions puissent être vraiment intrinsèquement dans tous les éléments euh, qu'on développe. Alors, je trouve que c'est important aussi de, 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 de travailler un peu en ce sens. Euh, WAPI est un outil. C'est un outil d'expression euh, pour les jeunes. C'est un outil pour euh, les espaces euh, éducatifs et de sensibilisation. Euh, mais il faut savoir euh, 
être capable de se les approprier de façon un peu plus globale et holistique qu'en en, en créant des espaces ghettoisés. Ce n'est pas, pas de cette façon-là que je pense qu'on va vraiment réussir à, à, à co-construire la société qu'on souhaite pour demain. My vision for education, I guess, would be... Um, it's important that uh, tomorrow be tinted by the youth's dreams and ambitions. Um, youth must be involved in creating... Um, the education systems that we want for the future. They will be the carriers of that vision in the next generations, and it's really important that they are involved in uh, the creation. Education for me is a really a sharing moment. moment. It's really important that uh, intergenerational dialogues be a part of, of education, um, that we acknowledge uh, that... Uh, We learn from different ways and that we learn uh, a lot through contact and through manipulation. Um, I think it's important that we use uh, a maximum of, of mediums in order to bring awareness on different elements. Um, I think we, if we look at the high dropout rates that First Nations and Indigenous peoples in our country already have in regards to education, for example. I think it's just a, a real statement that it's the way it is now is not adapted to how we are supposed to learn, uh, how we are made to uh, to empower by knowledge. Um, like like many other people, um, before being the executive director of the Wapikani Mobile Project, I went through a very difficult, you know, teen, teenage moment, and I, I searched for my own identity, and I realized that um, one of the things that I was able to do coming to Montreal as a young youth teenager was to ask all of my teachers to adapt my trainings and my courses to the elements that were important for me. So, for example, uh, when I... In my class on politics, I, I asked to uh, be able to understand and study the Indian Act. It was something that was really important for me. I needed to understand the Indian Act and what the impacts of the Indian Act was. And I was fortunate enough to have teachers that were open and willing to change a little bit the program in order to help me make sure that it's aligned with specific things that, uh, like that are important to me. So I think that, uh, uh, like we have here in Quebec, Kiona, like a, a CJEP. Uh, I think I was fortunate enough to negotiate my own Kiuna, but I would have loved to have something like that when I was uh, a youth and I and I needed to, to learn things that were very specific to me. Like, for example, in philosophy or in sociology, I wanted to study the relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous since the contact. Uh, um, I always, or spiritualities, different types of spiritualities, different types of traditional healing, different types of uh, traditional ceremonies in, in order for me to understand the variety Of, of our people. Um, so I think it's really important that the vision for education for our people is that we stay aligned with our languages, our traditions, our, we, we keep the memory of our elders and uh, knowledge holders and grassroots people very alive to make sure that they could stay uh, connected in the education system. Uh, and I know it's not a traditional way of looking at it if you look at the Quebec education system. Uh, they often see all of those elements more as... Um, activities out of the school curriculum. But for me, it's really integrated in the school curriculum. And it's because of those elements that we are able to retain all of the information that we want to retain and that we need to retain in order to create that judgment that we want out of the school. I think the importance getting out of school with the better judgment as possible, getting out of... of and school has to also be in different... For me, in different ways. You, school is not always sitting on a chair. School needs to be also through practice, being outside, uh, learning through through sharing with other people and other nations and, uh, and other types. So I think it's really important that we create more dynamics, I guess, in the education systems in order for, for, our, for our youth to, to feel that they are learning things that are important to them. Mm -hmm. they, they have their sphere It was part of the reasons why I remained in school when I was able to convince my teachers of certain elements that were important for me. And then I understood how knowledge is, is powerful because once you feel that you understand more and more, we often said, you know, knowledge is liberty, knowledge is powerful. 
but it's hard to understand when you're living so far away from what knowledge can really do and that you don't have a lot of role models around you to really understand what that does. Uh, we have people around us that, you know, might have went to school, but we don't really understand the impact of that knowledge on them. So I think it's really something that's very personal to everybody. So it's important that we, we try to adapt our, our, our education system to, to the key interests. Uh, I, I know it's hard, but try to adapt to the uh, evolution of our societies. Um, I have a teenage boy now who's 18, like a young adult, and he's into media and new technology and needs to understand how to create a, an online business, uh, an international, you know, uh, in an international world, which is something that is very difficult to find in, in the regular school curriculum, for example. So I think it's just important that we, we stay connected to the evolution of our young people and their interest and and that we make sure that we don't lose the knowledge holders and the grassroots and our elders maybe use more and more of the media and of the film so that uh, we know that our population is you know at the opposite uh, in terms of demographics than Quebecers or Canadians where you know the big big majority are all elderly people in in our societies the big big majority are our youth uh, so that means that we need to record the memory of our elders because we are at that point in time where we could lose those memories, uh, the language, the traditional lang traditional healing practices, the traditional uh, ways of, of doing whatever. Is it cooking? Is it uh, arts and crafts? And uh, So we need to try to focus on all of that and record all of that in order to lose as less, as less possible and be able to have the tools to transfer that knowledge as as our societies evolved and our, and our youth of the day become the, the adults of tomorrow. So I hope they have that knowledge and they have the opportunity to, you know, keep it and share it with their own children. I think that's how we culturally stay alive is that we stay connected to our roots and, and it is a turning point now for our indigenous societies to make sure that uh, we stay connected to our, our grandfathers and, and ancestors and and we make sure that we record all of that for future generations. Wapikoni is is an education tool uh, for uh, those that are participating in the project. As they create, they learn about themselves, about the angle of what they want to share. Uh, through the knowledge that they're sharing with their grandparents, uh, the intergenerational dialogues they're having, or or the research they're doing, and and they're constructing their their critique, their their way of, of seeing life. Their, their, there's a lot of learning in this creation process. It's it's an amazing learning process, an empowering process, and realizing that. Uh, what you are creating will then also serve as an education tool for others. Not only you when you created it, you and your teammates, uh, but also how we could use that, that, that creation to be part of the education system with other nations and other peoples and, and not First Nations. And so it's, it's, it's an education tool at many, many angles. Uh, it could be used in the traditional education system as it uh, serves as an education transformation tool for those that are creating those uh, those those short films or, or video clips or poems that allows them to understand how they see themselves in the world or how they want the world to be and how they hope that we collectively contribute to that world they want uh, or how do they want us to collectively collectively contribute to promoting change in what's going on now. So it's it's a very empowerful, empowering tool, and it's something, Wapikoni is just an inspiration at many, many levels, and it's a tool that must be used and used and continue to grow. Um, I mean, it's a, it creates... And it also serves a lot in terms of preservation, preservation of traditions, preservation of languages. Um, but it also creates a new dynamics because youth are, um, 
Indigenous youths from their community are the only ones that could really uh, transform their traditions in a way that stay respectful to our elders, uh, that stay respectful to our traditional ways. So they are the one that could create that contemporary library um, that is so respectful uh, because it is a transformation, but uh, with such great respect of the initial way. Uh, and, and I think that through that transformation, um, our, um, our practices, or our ways become easier for non-Indigenous people to understand. Uh, and, uh, and that's another type of dialogue that we must favor, not the only one, but it's another type of dialogue that we must favor, and I think the youth can do that through using the Wapikoni tools. Yeah. I dream of, of a society where our Indigenous youth will understand the power of the knowledge and, and will feel um, that uh, the education... Um, world that they have access is one that is fair, interesting, um, equitable to uh, the system that is offered to non-Indigenous peoples. Because today, um, I sometimes feel and I've heard stories and I've witnessed uh, people say, you know, that wanted to study in a specific field, for example, that was um, highly scientific. And, uh, and in their community, they just couldn't access the the type of classes that they needed to access that. So I, I really hope that in the future, you know, the investments will be made in order for um, the education systems to be fair and accessible to all of our Indigenous youth. Um, but like I also said, I mean, I'm, I'm a strong believer that uh, through the creation and arts and culture, we could also, you know, and I think it's really important that we invest in that in our education system so that we create those dialogues, we create those spaces for creation, and we create that alternative way of thinking and of learning uh, through practice through dialogue, through research, that is different than the traditional way. Um, and that we adapt uh, the content of our, of our education system in order to, you know, be coherent with um, our society's evolution. And, and society is moving fast, and, and it's important that the education system be able to adapt as much as possible. So, and I dream of, of a future where... Um, you know, we will have as as many Indigenous graduates uh, that uh, Quebec or Canada. We have parity of, of graduates. I think uh, we need to have graduates from our own school systems, too. We need to strengthen our own school systems within our, our communities and uh, and have also our universities or, or having programs that are very well adapted to uh, specifics of our, of our realities in order to have more and more of our people graduate and um, so that we can, you know, create more and more of our industries, our businesses, strengthen our own self-governance systems. Um, it's through education that we're going to be able to, to do that. And that's more for an Indigenous perspective on education, but I think it's also important that in the non-Indigenous education system, there's a better place of our common history and of our truth and of our memory in order to really create that dialogue, that space for action uh, that we have a little bit of difficulty moving into. Um, I think forgiveness, forgiving ourselves for whatever hurt that we we as Indigenous people might have done to ourselves and, and forgiving ourselves as non-Indigenous people for, you know, being part of a society that created hurt to Indigenous people is a really important education moment that we need to collectively pass in, in order to move towards something that's more positive and that we co-create a new future for, for our people and our new cohabitation uh, together. Wapikoni needs, uh, obviously, um, many partners that believe in, in, in the strength of, of the process. Um, I think it's important also that um, Indigenous people from all over Quebec and all over Canada understand that Wapikoni is there too um, and that uh, they utilize it the best way possible for themselves. Um, so, you know, we always need resources. Um, I, I, I would like to see uh, more and more human resources be involved 
in order for us to keep that dialogue going with all of the communities that we've visited. We've, we've visited like 170, 180 communities just in Canada and so many communities down south in Central America. And, we, and to keep those, those partnerships alive, it's important that we have the resources, the human resources here in order to maintain those relationships and continue. Because Wapikoni's methodology is that we pass in our community, we stay about five, six weeks of preparation and we're there with the youth in order to create and at the end of our stay we have a big community gathering where everybody sees the films that everybody created. It's a grand moment of of pride and, and everybody's very, very happy. But it's also important for me that we continue that dialogue with the community development, uh, the health and social services, the education ser services, the school. Um, I'd love for Wapikoni to also be seen as a tool to help in their community development. Uh, when, when they work on, uh, for example, when they work on uh, their objectives for suicide rates or their objectives for um, dr school dropouts uh, and they're trying to figure out uh, the different activities that they want to put in place in order to reduce those rates. Um, I'd love Wapikoni to be sitting at that table with them in order to figure out how we can contribute to that, how we could be part of, of thinking um, a, a community development for themselves and if we want to do that with all of the 600 communities across Canada, we obviously need a lot more resources. But I'd, I'd really love for us to just be not only a tool for creation and a tool for for um, distribution worldwide, which is amazing, but I'd also like us to see us become a tool for community development and community empowerment because uh, we're very much at the individual uh, empowerment because of the creation being done by an individual or a few team members. But I'd like it to maybe as a long, long-term vision, I'd love that we also be involved in a lot more of the community impact uh, and, uh, and that we take part in those conversations with the leaders of each communities to see how we could plan um, um, our visit and our stays aligned with their vision for their community development. So that would be something I'd love and, and uh, that we could we could probably use in the future. Uh, we could also use, um, you know, there's a lot of need, there's a lot of, of communities that we could visit in a year when we have to choose and we have to kind of figure out, we have to limit ourselves to the equipment we have and to the, 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 the trucks we have available. So I think uh, as, as we grow, uh, I, I would see also our, our trucks and equipment grow in order for, uh, for more and more youth to access uh, the services and and the tool, and and more and more you to you know speak out uh, on uh, have the opportunity to speak out on their issues, their elements, their their dreams for the future. The only thing I dream of is that more and more and as many as possible can can use Wapikoni to speak and and talk and contribute to society.